Today I wish to come to the defense of the King James Version against a kind of attack recently leveled against it by Stephen Anderson. You heard right, I am defending the King James Version against Arch King James Onlyist Stephen Anderson's charge that the King James contains a typo in Deuteronomy 21. And it was actually another leading King James Onlyist who disagrees with both me and Anderson who asked me to talk on the phone this morning to tell me about this little kerfuffle. You can't make this stuff up, and I couldn't pass up this opportunity. I haven't followed the work of leading King James only as Stephen Anderson. It's difficult to hear any of his substantive points over the din of the personal abuse that he levels at me and countless others. I do know that he is a very intelligent and very gifted man, that he knows several languages, including the biblical ones, but he's also been positively vile in his speech. Malicious, slanderous, coarse, the heir of Peter Ruckman, though he does, to his credit, reject the double inspiration view associated with Ruckman. One time a church member of mine went searching on YouTube for Mark Ward because early in 2020 I was putting out my church's sermons on another channel that I wasn't using. And this church member stumbled across a Stephen Anderson video that was titled, Fake Scholar Mark Ward Exposed. Thankfully, the church member just laughed, and I, for my part, was glad to find out the truth about myself so that I could give up scholarship once and for all and go back to YouTube where I belong. But Anderson has gone much further than this in his malice toward me, and I predict that he'll do so again after I release this video. I can't say I relish the attention that I will get from this shimmy eye. But I say with David, let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse Mark Ward, who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And I also say with David, Is there not a cause? The King James translators are dead. Somebody needs to defend them against Anderson's charge that the King James contains a typo in this place in Deuteronomy. So here's what Anderson posted on Facebook just a week ago as I released this video. This threw me for a loop, Anderson says. When I was preaching tonight, Deuteronomy 21:22. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. And then, of course, the passage goes on to say that you take him down. I've always just read this as, and he be put to death. But it says, and he be to be put to death. It's a typo, Anderson says. I looked it up in Hebrew, and it should just say, and he be put to death. It's funny because I think I've always just read it that way anyway because my brain was correcting the typo. One would assume that such a statement would be incendiary from Anderson. Again, I just haven't been able to make myself listen to enough Stephen Anderson to really understand his position on the King James. I mainly heard him in his one-on-one -on -one discussion with James White a few years back. But I sure thought Anderson took a strong and strict King James-only position. Usually, such men don't posit any kind of error in the King James, not even a typo. At the very least, they've got constituencies who expect them to maintain the perfection of the King James. I was very surprised to hear that Anderson did this. How in the world was it worth the risk of lost followers? And, in fact, some people reacted to Anderson in just the way I would have predicted. One man wrote, KJV has it right. Anderson replied, I'm sure the translators got it right, but this is a typo probably introduced by the printer. Even this is not acceptable to most King James onlyists, and Anderson got exactly the kind of response I would have expected from another commenter. No, it is not a typo. If you think you have found an error in the King James Bible, you are the error. Why are you placing doubt on the King James Bible and its accuracy? This is not a typo. Thank you. One commenter who I happen to know was commenting tongue-in-cheek wrote, Impossible. King James is perfect. You're one of them modern perversions guys, aren't ya? And Anderson replied, The translation is perfect, but every book has typos. That's Anderson's view. The King James is perfect, but typos are okay. One wonders how that might apply to New Testament textual criticism, but I digress. Anderson went on in the thread to give what he described as more evidence that it is a typo. Anderson quoted Tyndale's translation and the Bishop's Bible at Deuteronomy 21:22, neither of which contains this admittedly difficult phrasing, he be to be put to death. He's right, of course, and this is apropos. Anderson wrote the Bishop's Bible was the rough draft that the King James translators were working from, and Anderson is completely right. And it reads just like the Hebrew in this verse. There is no way the King James translators changed it to be to be. It was obviously just an error by the printers. Anderson is getting in trouble. Some commenters are following him, of course, but others are weighing in against him, and with some alarm in their tone, as I showed. I won't go any further into the back and forth. There's been more even since I wrote this script. That's a long enough setup. What's the truth of the matter? I will summarize my viewpoint on this passage, then explain and defend it. I believe that if he be to be is not a printer error, 
it was what the King James translators intended to say. And I don't think it was an error on the part of the King James translators either, an error that was then preserved by printers who assumed that the translators knew what they were doing. No, I think the King James translators made a defensible, if convoluted, translation choice, and that Anderson has been tripped up by an obscure archaism. I would not call this a false friend because I just don't think it misleads the reader. It's just about impossible to process this for contemporary English speakers as written. So I would call it instead an obsolete syntactical construction. I've got three big reasons for thinking all this. First, this wording goes all the way back to the 1611 King James, and the wording was preserved in the various minor revisions that the King James underwent, all the way up until the creation of the 1769 version that is still in use today and that I hold. A number of scholars had a chance to fix this typo over the centuries, if it was one, and they did not. Despite what those that oppose themselves might think, I have a very high regard for the work of the King James translators. I've heard some people say that strain at a gnat might be a typo, but I've also seen someone demonstrate that that phrase was in use at the time. I'm not personally aware of any typos in the King James, aside from the wicked Bible I saw at the Museum of the Bible, which read, Thou shalt commit adultery. That surely was a printer error. Ironically, I have more implicit faith in the abilities of all the folks who touched the various King James revisions over the centuries, at this point anyway, than does Stephen Anderson. That feels weird. But there's a big reason that my gut led me toward trust rather than typo when Stephen went the other direction. I think I've spent more time really dwelling and dwelling hard on language change. So second reason, I actually think I can parse the Elizabethan English here based on what I know about the history of English grammar. There's a point at which this becomes difficult, as we'll see, but still, let me do my best to parse the Elizabethan English in this passage. Let's break it down. The King James regularly uses the construction, if he be, or if she be. We would almost certainly say, if he is, or better, if he's. Like, if he's poor, he has a funny way of showing it. That's what we would say. But the King James uses, in this situation, what is called a subjunctive form. We still have this form in contemporary English, we just don't use it in all of the same situations that King James does. Language has changed. When we express a wish or a demand, we use a different form of the verb than if we're describing what is happening or has happened. Google sent me to these examples. I demand that everyone have an opportunity to speak. If Jane were here, she could tell us what to do. I think that many people would not observe this distinction in form. They'd say, I demand that everyone here has an opportunity to speak, and if Jane was here, she could tell us what to do. So the subjunctive is a little twee. It's the kind of thing that English professors do, but many others ignore. But it's still absolutely in use by educated folks. And check out this example of the contemporary English subjunctive. Sharon insisted that she be notified of any problems. This is recognizably a little formal, but just as recognizably current. This subjunctive construction isn't gone. I confess that I'm not a historical grammarian. I'm a historical philologist. I deal most typically in the meaning of individual words, not in sentence structure or grammar. But I think the King James translators used this subjunctive more often than we do. I think they used it for conditionals, for if statements. I went and checked out this hypothesis as best I could. And I was right. Wikipedia, at least, citing a scholarly source, noted this same feature of language. Wikipedia said, the subjunctive is occasionally found in clauses expressing a probable condition, such as if I be found guilty. More common is am or should be. For more information, see English conditional sentences. This usage is mostly old fashioned or formal, although it is found in some common fixed expressions, such as if need be. Isn't that great? Isn't language so cool? If they still worked at Logos, I talked to my linguistic buddies, Jacob Cerrone and Michael Aubrey about this, but Wikipedia just has to be right here, and they cite a serious scholarly resource. The very same linguistic force that gave us the stock phrase, if need be, gave us the subjunctive in Deuteronomy 21, 22. I think that's what we're seeing. If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and if he be, I'll trail off there. Let's think of some ways we could finish this sentence, and we can grab them from other places in the King James. These are direct King James quotes. If he be not able to bring a lamb, if he be poor and cannot get so much, then he shall take one lamb for a trespass offering to be waived. I'll keep the quote shorter now. Just look at the kinds of things that can fill in the blank after if he be. Look at the kinds of statuses with which you can fill in that blank. If he be not able to restore it, if he be not redeemed, if he be poorer than thy estimation, 
if he be a god, if he be able to fight with me, if he be gotten into a city. I think what we have in Deuteronomy 21, 22 is this, if he be to be put to death, or if he be in this status, namely about to be put to death, Maybe whoever made this decision and whoever validated it over the centuries by not revising it felt that they were holding to the logical order in the verse. If a man commits a sin and if he is to be put to death, which naturally comes before he's actually hanged on a tree, then don't leave his body up all night. It's all a little obscure and difficult, but it's what I think is happening, though I admit I can't find a precisely parallel construction in the King James. Third, and finally, the Oxford English Dictionary sure seems to include this construction and a sense for it and citations of it. If you know my channel, my reverence for the King James Version is matched only by my reverence for the OED. Both the King James translators and the OED editors were responsible, rigorous scholars. I have a bumper sticker on my car that says, the OED says it, I believe it, that settles it. English loves me, this I know, for the OED tells me so. And if I look in the OED, as I am wont to do, like want all the time, like want not, waste not, like for Polly's want of a cracker, the battle was lost. This is what I find under the word be. With infinitive, which is exactly what we have in Deuteronomy 21, 22, be to be. This means expressing an appointed or arranged future action, hence also expressing necessity, obligation, duty, fitness, or appropriateness, which is exactly what we have in Deuteronomy 21, 22. The arranged future action is that he be to be put to death. My brain still wants to hear this the way Anderson's did. Man have committed a sin worthy of death and he be put to death. The to be still feels extra to me, but according to the Oxford English Dictionary, these words did not feel extra to a number of English writers over the centuries. Udall wrote in 1588, if the whole be to be observed until the end. Locke wrote in 1692, if a gentleman be to study any language, it ought to be that of his own country. Defoe wrote in 1725, mighty uneasy about their being to go back again. Malthus wrote in 1803, it must be to be dependent on. Some of those writers did not use the precise phrase we see in the King James in our Deuteronomy passage, but some did. And using Google Books, I can find more. The phrase Anderson sees as a typo gets used in similar ways in literature, from very broadly speaking, around the time of the King James. Here's a defense of the government established in the Church of England for ecclesiastical matters. This is a bit obscure, but the author is speaking of pastors who are ordained but don't have a congregation. If he is out of his charge or congregation, he is out of his ministry, and therefore he is a layman. So the writer says of such a man, an ordained man who doesn't have a church, if he preach, his preaching be no preaching. And if he minister the sacraments, they are no sacraments. This writer goes on to say, if those actions of his be to be otherwise accounted, then is it by reason that he himself is to be otherwise accounted that did them. And if he be to be accounted otherwise, then it is in respect he is a minister. I frankly have difficulty following this older English, but I can see some key things. I can see exactly the same words I saw in the King James, and I can see them being used in what sure seems to me to be the same way. Francis Bacon used the phrase, if he be to be commended. Another writer wrote, if he be to be counted a wise and discreet man. Another writer wrote in 1707, if he be to be found. Another wrote of Christ, if he be to be worshipped. There weren't tons of these references, this phrase is obscure, but I don't think it could have been a typo in all of those instances. This phrase got used before and after the King James in situations where the King James was not being quoted. I think that most contemporary readers of the King James just aren't grounded enough in the way language changes to spot all the subtle ways in which language change shows up in the King James. And I don't think most contemporary readers of the King James are practiced in using the tools that can help them uncover these archaisms from grammars to Google Books. But I'm gonna wrap up this video by giving a big point to Anderson. Did you know that you can actually go look at one of the copies of the Bishop's Bible that were marked up by the King James translators as they did their translation work? And if you do this, you'll find the strongest point for Anderson's view. I personally am not aware of any other Bishop's Bible copies that were used by other portions of the King James Committee. And I admit, he be is not present in the notations here. Just look. You can see them adding the word and at the beginning of the verse, and sure enough, that shows up in the King James. You can see them crossing out trespass and writing something I just cannot read for the life of me above it. And sure enough, the 1611 King James reads committed sin instead of committed a trespass. But the translators who notated this copy of the Bishop's Bible don't cross out a 
before trespass, and yet the 1611 King James does drop that word. I checked with Tim Berg, the master of all these things, and it's simply not clear what relationship this image has to what we actually see in the King James. I do think there was some other step between this page and the original 1611. And maybe that step was a rogue printer who did his own thing in two places. That's possible. Anderson could be right. He's certainly right about the Hebrew, which is another big point for him. But let me offer my interpretation of what I'm seeing in this image. Two little points. First, the sentence is incomplete if you go directly by the notations, presuming that they wrote sin above trespass, even though I can't read it. This is the way the verse would read, going strictly by the notations. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. That's grammatically wrong. You at least need is, and if he is to be put to death. So maybe this wasn't meant to be final. I just don't know. Second, take your newfound knowledge of the English subjunctive and look at the change they made to the word hangest. Hangest is not the subjunctive form. Hang is. The King James translators were clearly, to my eyes, trying to turn the final two verbs in the sentence into subjunctives. That, I think, supports my overall read of this passage. I could be wrong. Let's see if Stephen Anderson could.